Thank you, Kevin. I am very honored to have Hellwatch USA having invited me to talk. I am uh, aware of your organization and your activities, and I feel, as I said, honored to be part of your meeting. I would like to discuss with you today, as a member of the Massachusetts Teachers Association Health and Safety Committee, we have been engaged since March on uh, a lot of activities to try to provide services and represent the members, the educators, that include not only teachers, but also teachers' aides and assistant teachers and nurses and custodians in the schools. And um, in relation to the COVID-19 epidemic. So, first of all, I would like to start by saying that there has been a high degree of controversy on the issue of reopening the schools. There have been very bitter confrontations between the educators represented by MTA and represented by other teachers union, like the Boston Teacher Union, and the school administrators and the school superintendents. And I would like to start my presentation by basically describe very fast how these confrontations look like, and, and you can see how bitter and complicated the whole issue is. So uh, I call this the gathering of the maelstrom. You know, I'm going to describe to you the MTA responses to the pandemic, and I am f going to focus in the experience of one of the MTA represented the school system. This is the system of the city of Andover, Massachusetts, and the MTA local is called the Andover Education Association. The Andover Education Association have what they describe as a work safety action address the first discussions and dialogue that they have with the school system. And this happened at the end of August of 2020, in which the school superintendent of Andover wanted to accelerate the process of reopening of the school, and he says that he basically ordered the educators, the teachers, to show up at the school for a training of how the reopening was going to happen. The teachers were concerned about how well the building was being taken care in preparation to a number of people, that is the teachers coming for this training, and they demurred, they told the superintendent, we will be very glad to have this training session for reopening virtually. That is, why don't we organize a big Zoom meeting and whatever materials we need to discuss for reentry? Let's don't do it in the building because we are wary about the quality of the air and the cleanliness of the building at this time. Nothing has been done in preparation. So what they say is we'll do it remotely. We will use the computers and everybody could get into that. They say we are doing this for the sake of safety. This received a very negative reaction from the school system and from the superintendent that if they refuse to come into the building when they were asked, he will declare that they were in an illegal strike for having proposed having the meeting virtually instead of in person. And not only that, he denounced the union and the educators to the state labor board. The state labor board met in a very fast meeting and they decided in a uh, very fast decision that this indeed was an illegal strike, the fact that they didn't want to, to do it virtually rather than coming into the building. And this immediately went to the press and the Boston Globe, which have a traditionally antagonistic position against the Massachusetts Teacher Association, he immediately described, he said, the MTA union disrupting the reopening process. Now, this was answered in, in the newspaper, too. The newspaper has a session that's called a Reader's Forum, in which one of the members of the MTA say that the real disruption was not by the teachers, but it was by the decisions of the administration of the governor of Massachusetts. He, he says, this MTA member in the Reader's Forum, he says, the last minute decisions are designed to impose an imaginary safety in the midst of a continued pandemic. 
And he says that is what is disrupted, not the teachers wanted to have a virtual training that at the present training. The president of the MTA also responded saying that the teachers were asked to take risks and there was not prudent planning on health and safety issues when they were coming to the building and that the MTA disagree with the decision of uh, compel them to enter into a place that in the view of the teachers was unsafe. This uh, basically after the threat of being accused of being in an illegal strike, the teachers relented and they entered the school and went through the training under the rest. They say that this decision was excessive and punitive and also they declare that they have a vote of no confidence against the school superintendent. This eventually led to the school superintendent to resign in the first two weeks of November and uh, bargaining on safety issues on reopening and when it should be present teaching or virtual teaching is still continue being negotiated at this time in Andover. So that's how I want to start my talk and telling you that MTA is trying to deal with these educators that are extraordinarily concerned about their selves, the students, and eventually the community because of the pandemic and the possibilities of having the schools as centers of infection on the pandemic. So that is uh, real life for you. Now, what the Health and Safety Committee of the MTA has done, what actions have been taken? As you can see, this has been a real challenge, mostly because we are facing a patchwork of really ever-changing state policies that with the fluctuations of the pandemic cases, the regulations and requirements have been changing constantly for the educators for the Department of, of uh, Elementary and Secondary Education of the State of Massachusetts. The Health and Safety Committee has said that our aim is that we want to return to the school as safely but, and as quickly as, as possible, you know, but the emphasis is on safely. So what, what have we done about to address this uh, safety? Well, the Health and Safety Committee have a meeting every week and have consultants that have working with us in all kind of the technical aspects of the pandemic. Epidemiologists, uh, ventilation experts and physicians have been advising and we have been discussing with them as well as institutions like, as you can imagine, CDC, ASHRAE, that is the uh, organization that deals with ventilation in buildings, the American Industrial Hygiene Association, all kinds of institutions have pronounced themselves about schools and how they should reopen. And we were trying to summarize that information. So the actions that the committee have taken is, uh, as I said, production of documented resources that were made available for educators and the production of a guide for bargaining for safe returning to schools. In all the 400 places in the state that the MTA represent educators, there are being negotiations about how to return to school and so we prepare a guide for bargaining and that's the basis of what I'm presenting here is why we are telling the teachers that they should bargain about to have a safe reopening. The committee also has produced, as I said, a number of ventilations and have a lot of documentation that has been distilled and digest for the use in bargaining. As I said, they have been consistently weekly meetings. They have been, I, I give you a view here of the number of the schools that have requested the Health and Safety Committee to intervene to evaluate the circumstances of reopening. And we have been involved on visiting, as of now, 50 schools in the state. This is a, a sample of them. We also have engaged a law firm of consultants that always work with the MTA that help in the process of bargaining and to request the technical issues that we consider necessary in K-12 schools for reopening. The president of the Massachusetts Teacher Association has been participating in most of these health and safety committee meetings. 
and we have been published these documents in Google Documents, making it available to all the presidents of the locals. So this is available in Google Documents, I say. So what are the principles and the elements of the position of the MTA on the pandemic? The general principles, and these are basically public health principles, is that the first consideration is to apply primary prevention strategies. That is, primary prevention is to prevent the virus itself to enter the breathing zone of the people in schools, that is, the students, that is, educators, and that is, the staff. Some of these strategies, of course, is virtual teaching. Nobody shows up. You just do it in the computer, and you basically have a lockout. That is, in terms of primary prevention, that would do it. You know, there is no way of being exposed to the virus. Also, if you can increase the ventilation substantially, as they do in hospitals, in operating rooms in hospitals, and so on, and the technical term is air changes per hour bigger than five in, in the classrooms, that will go a long way to avoid the virus to be breathed in as an aerosol. And also, when you cannot avoid it, there are high-risk educators like, for example, nurses or school drivers, bus drivers, and some of the cleaning staff, they will require really personal equipment to do their work, comparable to the one that is used in healthcare and hospitals. And the, the second consideration, of course, is the secondary prevention strategies that are just as, as, as important as, for example, safe distance within the classrooms. Everybody uses face covering, so if somebody happened to be infected, we have less of a probability of exposing the people around them. Also, there is testing for case identification. There is testing of not symptomatic persons by contact tracing after you identify cases. All of this is being considered in the documentation that we provide to the educators to deal with the school systems. And these are the principles basically is that only when the buildings are safe is that the educators will return. Uh, we should follow the established parameters to return. However, this has been a very difficult thing, as I was saying before, because they are constantly moving the goalposts about what it is. Principles there. And now that after the principle is the specific elements on the guideline to the presence of the teachers locals in the different K-12 schools. And the first one is that the element is, and we get details on this, that the presence should request training to the administration of what the students and educators and the staff and the families should do during the pandemic. And there is a lot of directions of CDC about the elements of protection. Everybody should be aware of, of, of what they are, and they should be pre-training of all these different groups. The second, of course, is to provide quality air, to provide air that is not infected, and the way you of doing this is you determine the percentage of uh, outside fresh air that is coming into every classroom and there is uh, technical ways of uh, measuring exactly the percentage of outside air coming in and that you use that in order to determine the air change per hour that might be happening in the room when there is uh, uh, affirmative ventilation in the room. Of course windows help, they will, they will open if they are but you cannot really count on windows to provide the ventilation, as you can imagine. We are talking about a more serious situation here. And as I said, you use the stream of air to measure the air changes per hour. The air also that is recirculated, normally is recirculated for purpose of heating or cooling. That recirculated air should be filtered with what is called a MERV-13 filter that will collect 90% of particles 99% of particles less than 3 microns, and you have to provide at least 20 cubic feet per person in rooms according with the ash ray guidelines, the Society of Engineers that do ventilation in buildings. Consideration should be made to UV disinfectants in the plenums of the ventilation, and also when there is not good ventilation, the bringing of portable HIPAA units to help the cleaning of the air in the classrooms. Then the issue of testing and contact tracing. We would like to see tests doing an educators weekly and 
uh, on students also whatever is feasible to be done in the school but the educators are the ones that are at the highest risk and the administrators must publicize the communications with local health departments because all the actions are based on the health departments where the schools are located. And if infection is suspected or if tests are positive, the location should be closed and they should be quarantined for at least 14 days. Protective equipment, as I said before, should be provided to the people in the schools at higher risk, like nurses and bus drivers, and also there should be a well-think uh, way of disposal of used personal protective equipment that could be a, a, a source of contamination. Um, there should be cleaning and disinfecting of surface, there should be protocols to do this, and there should be proper training of custodians for this cleaning. This is one of the aspects where transmission of the virus could happen, more and more we are finding out that the aerosol transmission might be more important, but this is important too, and this should be being taken care of, the cleaning and disinfecting of surfaces. There also should be sufficient hand washing and sanitation stations in the school. There should be hand sanitizers available in each classroom, and the, the sinks of water, they should have warm water and automatic dispensers for uh, drying your hands so that that won't be a source of contamination. Then there's the issue of social distances. The numbers in the classroom have to diminish to the point there is a distance of six feet between the students. There should be a health and safety committee of educators and administrators in which all these routines and all these protocols will be discussed. There should be a full-time nurse in every building so that they could deal with coordinating the preventing activities and be prepared to do teaching and learning on the plans of what to do when there is uh, some cases that are identified. So I said this guideline was distributed in July 2020. What the educators say is say the union is not trying to deprive individuals and families of educational services. The union is trying to have an orderly process by which we know how to give those services safely and consistently. It has been an intent of uh, pit life and safety against learning, and we say that that's really unconscionable to make that dichotomy, that it's either life and safety or it's learning, but that we cannot have both. We can have both. There is some unsettling news, as you know. This is my last uh, slides that since September the, the percentage of people positive of COVID in Massachusetts have increased by a factor of five. There is more than 2,000 a day. There are 46,000 cases from people between 20 and 29, that is young people, but all age groups have hospitalizations over 46%. And most case distributions have shifted toward people that are less than 50 years old, that is young people. The Boston criteria for reopening the schools is that the positive testing should be below 4%. Right now, we are between 4.4 and 5 in Boston and in other localities, and there is consideration, so basically, we seen the reopening of the schools that have been opened. So, thank you.